<laughs> okay, good evening. Welcome everyone. My name's Brooklyn with the Nebraska Legislative Study Group. And tonight we are here with candidate from Legislative District 4, Cindy Maxwell Ostick. Welcome, Cindy. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm happy of course, to be here. We all know and love you for your hard work and as one of the study group founders. But tonight we really want to focus on getting to know a little bit more about you and your campaign. So if you want to just start us off with um, a little bit about your um, background. Sure. Um, well, OK, so first, I'm Cindy Maxwell Ostick, and I apologize. My kids are in the background. I'm an independent, and I'm running for legislative district number four here in Nebraska, which is West Omaha. And I am originally from Iowa. I've been in Omaha for over 30 years. and have um, over the years uh, lived mainly in Millard. I lived in Florence actually in North Omaha for a while and then in Millard. And um, the last few years, we have just super been super focused on the legislature and trying to help educate everyday Nebraskans on how to become involved so that we can help the legislators make the best laws for our state so that it would benefit everyday Nebraskans. And over these last few years, as we've become more involved in learning about it, I have um, at times been impatient with the things that are um, still left undone uh, here in our state. And I've had many people ask me and tell me to run, including some senators. And I think that I just had tried to recruit other people, you know, as a recruiter, that's my background. And I had asked many people to, to run and consider it and, had to come to the realization that it actually was me. <laughs> so I'm happy and proud to be here. I hope my um, family will be proud and I hope to do our district proud too. Okay, great. Um, so just so, since a lot of people might not know that you have other experience um, in political realms, um, like your experience with uh, Rank Choice Nebraska. Mm -hmm. And do you want to talk about that? Sure. I um, could go on <laughs> about ranked choice voting, but just um, in an overview way, the reason I believe it is important um, for our state to implement ranked choice voting is because the more fair way of voting actually produces a winner that has 50% plus one of the vote. So you may not win unless and until you achieve that 50% plus one majority. And at this time, we do have elections that happen in Nebraska where is a plurality winner. And for example, if you had four or five or more candidates for a particular office and the winner only achieved, say, 25% of the vote because it had been split so far, um, that would mean 75% of the voters didn't choose that person. And so one of the benefits to majority winners is that they would have the support of more people within the community to help them make better laws. So I'm uh, definitely very uh, interested in ranked choice voting and I really appreciate Senator McAllister because he actually brought a bill last year, LB 125, um, to bring ranked choice voting to certain state level positions. And then this year he introduced a bill um, to make it an option for local municipalities to implement ranked choice voting. And fortunately, they're both still stuck in committee. Um, it's a short session. I'm afraid we're not going to get to all of the bills. And that's sad because I think that it would be a great um, way for our, for our voters to be able to pick their elected officials. And so you are the president of Rank the Vote Nebraska. Yes, I'm very proud. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Um, and what else are you involved in in our community um, outside of the legislature? So as a person, I should back up and just tell a little bit about myself, I guess. My business background is in HR and recruiting and sales. And so um, I worked in uh, several different organizations and then eventually as an executive recruiter here in Omaha, 
until I had three kids, um, actually right in a row, our three were all under the age of two and a half. And so daycare became um, just really uh, out of reach as far as to make sense, you know, um, for our family. And so since I've been at home, I have volunteered with our kids school and things like that, but then also with um, other organizations to do with hunger. And um, I've also been involved with things, you know, to do with voting rights. I have been very proud that I became a deputy registrar with our election commission so that I could register people to vote. And I volunteered with the League of Women Voters to do that as well. In fact, one of the times I'm most proud of, and I won't go on too long, but I attended a naturalization ceremony. And that was just so moving to see people who were becoming new American citizens and then signing up so that they would be available to vote in the next election. And that just was something I was very proud about. And um, I've been involved with observing elections as a nonpartisan poll observer with Civic Nebraska. And um, I'm on the advisory board for nonpartisan Nebraska. And I just try to help where I can. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think, I think we all see you in all the work that you do with so many different organizations and, um, I'm tired just watching you most of the time. <laughs> um, but speaking of your civic minded heart, as, um, we like to say, um, I know that being an independent is really important to you. And so many of your va values are, are, um, close to that, you know, with Civic Nebraska and voting rights and League of Women Voters. Um, can you talk a little bit more about being an independent in Nebraska and mm -hmm. what that means to you? I Yes, I'd be happy to do that. <laughs> um, well, and it's something that I've had a lot of people ask me as I've been running for office and meeting with neighbors in the district. Um, I have been nonpartisan ever since I moved to Nebraska, and it's been uh, something that I feel very strongly about. It's not because I am against necessarily any specific party. I'm just really not uh, into politics. I'm more interested in the actual um, policies and the people and, you know, trying to um, find solutions. And so I have um, actually, I'm married to a Republican. A lot of people know that Fred's a Republican and a lot of um, people in my family are. And I'm also uh, very good friends and have helped try to have um, a success in electing some Democrats to office. So I'm uh, someone who's worked with both parties. And a lot of people don't realize there are at least 25% of us in Nebraska that are nonpartisan or independent. Some people who are members of the Green Party or other independents. And I think that it's important that we remember what really unites us. There's so much we all have in common. It's more um, actually that we have in common than we don't. And there's just too much focus on extreme partisanship where people are, you know, just really trying to um, take advantage of some divides. We're not all going to agree. But I think when we focus only on division, that's what we're going to get. And it's not really serving our state. It's just not productive. And there are too many things that we could be doing and uh, making our state better for our kids. And that's that's what I want to focus on. Yeah. And I think a lot of people are feeling that extremism on both sides, really. Um, and you know, they might, you know, really relate with you in that you are that independent. So, um, and I just do want to highlight that um, you've got a lot of work done already with some current senators. Um, Senator Tom Brewer um, has um, the LB777, which I'm sure we'll get to. Mm -hmm. And then obviously ranked choice voting with Senator McAllister. So you already have those accomplishments and I'll just go ahead and do that brag for you. <laughs> well, I, do, I just try, I've tried to help. Yeah. Right. I mean, in any way I can with those um, pieces of the legislation that they're bringing. Mm -hmm. So you've already like built some relationships with, um, you know, 
a variety of different senators. Well, that's what we were trying to do. In fact, if we can talk a little bit about the legislative study group, that's one of the things we've learned is that everyone in Nebraska has a responsibility as the second house to um, hold the unicameral accountable and to support them to help make the best laws for our state. And part of that process we're learning is not just following up when they're in the middle of debate. We learned, no, it's important to be involved when the um, bills are actually coming into committee and they're being you know, presented and, and discussed uh, in, during hearings. And then we actually learned, no, it's important to be involved and try to help legislators come up with good ideas for bills before that. And that takes relationship. And one of the things that we are really trying to help our members do is be in contact with their senator on an ongoing basis to let them know what their pri our priorities are, you know, as, as a constituent, calling Senator Hilkeman and telling him about my priorities and what I think is important for our state. And I think the more that we can encourage that, the better. And as a senator, I will definitely be um, very interested in hearing. I've already been asking, you know, what people are looking for from the legislature. And I would also continue something Senator Hilkman used to do before COVID was to hold a monthly coffee oh. and just have a, a, an ability for people in the district to come together. Um, you know, there's just good food, right? And coffee, but then also to visit. And then he would bring in a speaker and someone to come and talk about some of the issues facing our state. And I just think it was so educational and I would definitely follow his footsteps with that. Yeah, it sounds like um, transparency is really important to you. Mm -hmm, for sure. And I, I know that um, you know Senator Hilkeman as well. Um, we saw him the other day, didn't we? Yeah. <laughs> He, he ran into him and he knew he's, oh, hi, Cindy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's, he's actually, okay, so I'll brag on Senator Hilkeman and being such a healthy person. He's, um, I'm younger than him, but not nearly as in shape. He is someone who um, I think does a lot of endurance type biking and he and his wife were on a tandem bike the other day. Um, yeah. I was just, I was impressed with that. I was too. I was surprised to see him. I was like, oh, that's Senator Hilkeman. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. So we do have a couple questions. I want to keep us on track. Um, so um, a couple questions. Um, when it comes time, what are two most important bills in the state legislature now that you support? Oh, good. We were going to do that. And mm -hmm. um, two that you most oppose. Ooh, that's a good question. So diving right into um, wow. the, the bills that we've been following this session. Yeah, go go ahead. Okay, so anyone who knows me, I could go on. <laughs> and I'm obsessed, so we could, I could go in detail about so many um, pieces of legislation. But I guess the two uh, most important right now, um, the, uh, it's hard to pick. What they've been discussing this week is very important. Um, there have been bills, of course, regarding appropriation. They At the end of the session is where we do all of the budgeting. And there are three different kind of buckets of money that the legislators are trying to um, determine where the best place to spend it and how. And um, that is regular appropriations. They have extra money in the reserve that they're going to be spending down and then also ARPA money. And we've been listening this week to um, Senator Lathrop and the Judiciary Committee talking about how we need to address criminal justice reform in our state. And I know that there's um, a lot of people that have strong opinions about, do we build a new prison or not? Do we just you know, um, upgrade the current prison? The difficulty with the location is that it's hard for staffing, but no matter what, we are overcrowded and it's projected we would be overcrowded with the new prison as well. And that has to do with um, how people in our state are becoming incarcerated and then how long it takes to um, move successfully from the prison system. And that's what the Judiciary Committee has tried to focus on. It's been a very um, you know, lengthy, um, detailed process. And on the Judiciary Committee, page on the Nebraska legislature website, they actually have all the reports. And there's one that they've been really highlighting and it has to do with things like 
um, minimum sentencing and how people can, um, through programs, try to achieve parole earlier and how we can make sure that when we are sentencing people that the that it's fair mm-hmm. and equitable um, for you know the crimes that people commit um, we have an over representation of black um, indigenous and other people of color in our prison systems in Nebraska in fact it's an alarming uh, number we're like the 10th in the nation per capita. And that is something that, you know, I think Nebraskans of good conscience would want us to fix. And those types of larger, um, big picture type of reforms, that's more than just building walls. (laughs) So I'm hoping that they'll address that. It's something that is um, very important to our state. And I know that uh, some of the things that a lot of people are focused on have to do with school funding. Um, it's a big topic and it's one that is very entwined with property tax reform, which is another big um, issue that a lot of voters are concerned about. And a lot of people don't realize that the state has not been fully funding our private, excuse me, not private, our public schools have not been fully funded by the state on an ongoing basis. And so the schools, we all want good schools and to make sure that we have everything that the kids and the teachers and the staff need, we have to raise that through property taxes. And so uh, something that they've been working on, I wish that they would actually pick back up is a bill that Senator Lynn Walls brought this year. She worked with a lot of uh, school districts across the state and experts to try to address that formula and um, bring it more in line with other states that successfully fund their public schools with the state dollars. And so it wouldn't be such a burden on the property taxpayers at the local level. And that's hard for agriculture. It's hard, like if you think even here um, with homeowners with fixed incomes, you know, it gets really difficult when the property taxes just keep going up and up and up. So that reformulation process got off to a start at the beginning of the session, but I think they're not going to, they're not going to get it done. I'm very frustrated with that. So I will be doing everything I can next year when I'm a senator to try to move that along and so that we can just move on and get to other priorities. Um, And I I know the question said too that I most oppose. Mm -hmm. I uh, was very proud to testify regarding um, a resolution that had been brought to change the way the Nebraska legislature would be elected here in our state. It would have taken us from a nonpartisan um, process. And that I believe would be detrimental to our unicameral. And it was something that, um, you know, a lot of people said, well, why can't you just put the initial of your party behind your name? The actual resolution, and I think there may have been an amendment, but the one that was initially introduced would have just opened up our elections to not be conducted in a nonpartisan manner. And then the following legislatures next year or down the road could have implemented a fully partisan process, including party primaries and things like that. Hmm. And I did check with senators to make sure I understood that that would have been a potential um, outcome. And when I went to testify, I was very, very, glad to see so many senators from both parties, previous senators that came back to testify about that because they felt so strongly that we need to maintain our nonpartisan unicameral. That's the best format for our state. And um, that would have been one of them that I was opposing. I can't remember what the third question was. Okay. Well, we have more questions about legislation (laughs) and I I totally agree with you that, um, uh, keeping it nonpartisan is is super important, especially because <laughs> um, I don't think that you know adding a partisan politics is a way to get any kind of work done. So it's just it's not productive. No, nope. right, exactly. Okay, so we had a follow up question from Tisha. Okay. Oh, where to go? What do you think are some of the more 
boring or surprising things the Nebraska legislators take action on that directly impact people. Oh, yes, these are what we refer to as the uh, non-sexy bills. Yes. <laughs> things that people who are engrossed in the unicameral wouldn't be aware of. Yes, <laughs> but not hot button issues. Yes. And Good question, thank you. One that I'm actually, okay. I'm very concerned that we may not hear um, and get resolution on Senator McDonald's bill that he brought regarding, um, and I can't remember the number. I'm so sorry. I uh, Sometimes the numbers escape me. Uh, 298, LB 298. He brought this last year, actually. And I'm uh, friends and a member of the uh, West Omaha core team for the Heartland Worker Center. And we had um, a number of people that had talked with a couple of senators two years ago. And then the Heartland Worker Center and Immigrant Legal Center worked, I think, with Senator McDonald to bring a bill to solve a technicality. And it's still stuck, um, unfortunately, and hasn't moved forward. The um, I'm just going to just to so people who don't know, since um, the question is about people who maybe don't know about the, you know, not as talked about issues. LB 298 is a bill that would redefine public benefits and change provisions of the employment security law relating to the disqualification <laughs> of certain aliens. Which just sounds right. It's it's and it's actually a technical bill. And sad to me that it's not been solved. There's a lot of things that maybe, you know, there'd be a law or a change in um, uh, change within our state that could have an unintended consequence, right? So the legislature has to handle that. And sometimes they're very minor tweaks. This technical issue would actually have a very big impact on Nebraskans who unfortunately did not receive their unemployment compensation uh, it came to light, it had been happening for years, but it came to light in a more um, noticeable way large, to more people during COVID. And what happens is that, and Nebraska is only one last, I think the last state left that hasn't updated our um, terminology. As an HR person, this drives me crazy. Um, companies pay in to the unemployment insurance fund for their employees. And should someone become unemployed and they are eligible uh, for unemployment, then those dollars, you know, are paid to them through the state. And, you know, that whole process is taken care of um, through unemployment. And there are rules and regulations to who can work in Nebraska to even be eligible to work. You have to have specific proper documentation. And so work authorized immigrants, and that is people who are authorized and legal to work in our state and in the country, um, include DACA recipients and TPS recipients, people maybe who have come from their temporary protected status from uh, countries where they've had refugee situations. And the laws in Nebraska hadn't been updated regarding those definitions of specific work authorizations for like more than 10 years. So they didn't include DACA, they didn't include TPS, although those are work authorized um, definitions um, so that they're legal to work here. We didn't upgrade our laws regarding being eligible for unemployment with that. So during COVID companies were laying off workers and they were shocked to find that some of their employees were not getting unemployment compensation. This affected, um, they, it could have, we don't, I don't know the exact number, but I know it was hundreds and potentially up to a few thousand people that this would have impacted. And this is, these are people who were hardworking, people that have earned unemployment insurance and they have to still buy diapers and milk and shoes and pay rent and all these other issues. And it's money that the employers were actually paying into. So I'm sad that had become politicized and that that technical bill hasn't been passed yet because hopefully COVID is finished, right? And that we can all get more back to normal, but we have no idea what other kind of emergency may come up or just sometimes companies lay off because, right. you know, they're not 
able to maintain their workforce. So I'm, I'm really hoping that they will finish that here before the end of the session. Was that yeah, true? and there's so there's so many bills like that that mm -hmm. um, are really affect people's lives that we just don't hear about or do, you know aren't aware of. So there was one in insurance. Um, Senator Coulterman had a bill regarding um, a technicality with people who are on insurance and their prescription process. It's called step therapy. And a lot of insurance companies require uh, patients to try generic or less expensive prescriptions. If it doesn't work, then you can go to the next step and so on. But there are times when maybe you've changed insurance or you've, for whatever reason, already know that a certain prescription won't work for you. Your doctor already knows it and they want to prescribe you a different version or a different pill. Um, the insurance companies were making you fail first. They were called, it's, it's called step therapy. And so Senator Coltman brought a bill to, um, alleviate that obstacle for people to get their health care, you know, the way their doctor is trying to prescribe it. Um, my only uh, improvement to that bill would be that they also implement it for our Medicaid neighbors as well, because I think that all Nebraskans should have that opportunity to not have to go through step therapy. So hopefully in the future, um, when I'm a senator, I will either bring it or help someone else um, to continue to improve on that bill. You're thinking like a legislator already. Yeah, I've got a list. Oh, okay. I know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, I wanna get back to one of your main platforms, which is public education. And it looks like we had a follow-up question on education and staffing, if mm -hmm. we still have that question. Okay, what policies do you support that will help address the teacher and staff shortage in our public schools? Thank you for that question, such a good question too. As we know, teachers are overwhelmed and overworked and COVID is like been the last straw and underpaid. <laughs> so go ahead. Well, I mean, if I could snap my fingers, right? <laughs> and I think that um, I wouldn't know all the ways to solve that issue. I think we should trust the experts who can help us to understand why we are losing um, teachers. I know we can guess, and we've been hearing a lot about it, but I think that we also need to recognize that there are, um, like, for example, the teacher unions or, um, you know, experts across the country who've been studying this. And we've had a shortage coming for a long time, actually, here in Nebraska. It's just aggravated by the COVID situation. And I think we need to pay our teachers equitably and in an attractive way. Um, I had a friend who I was trying to help find a position. I'm my kids go to Millard. I'm very proud Millard public school uh, parent. And I was trying to help a friend to apply for a position at the Montessori at our local elementary school. And the parent position only paid like 11 or $12. Um, and it's just, I mean, you could work at the gas station or Burger King and make more money, you know? So that's a difficulty. And um, as far as the other things, I think a lot of teachers are facing um, issues with some of the testing and other requirements. And I think they're working on that during the during this session. I hope that they're gonna solve some of those problems. And I think a lot of it also comes down to parents supporting our schools. And the teachers and the school systems are accountable to us, but we're accountable to them as well so that they can succeed and help our kids, you know, put the foundation for their, their futures, right? And I think that there's just been so much distrust and a lot of, um, just a lot of things that really aren't actually um, happening in school. I mean, there was a bill brought in another state where they were going to put cameras in every classroom, right? And someone said, oh, we should do that in Nebraska. I think a lot of us realize the teachers don't need to be monitored with cameras. And we honestly don't want our children monitored that way either. I don't want other people watching my kid in math class or, you know, anywhere else. So, I mean, these kind of um, solutions looking for a problem they're just right. not, it's just not productive. I think we need to um, really try to find the 
real things that uh, are difficult for our teachers and try to actually solve it. I think a lot of times, unfortunately, it's bigger than the legislature, but the legislature can be, take a leadership role. And um, I think we need to, because we can't grow our state. That's another thing I, I was going to talk about. My priority as far as growing our state and our businesses, I recruiting people to Nebraska, one of the really just shining points was always public education. And that was one of the things that was really um, something that would always be a draw. And we really can't afford to um, lose as many people as we do from our state. We're losing more people than we're bringing in. And we need growing families in our state so that we can grow our businesses. And that helps everyone be successful. So I'm sorry, long, long and that, that was that is one of your um, platforms, right? And it kind of ties into your small businesses and helping small businesses because small businesses can't function without good people. Right. So um, that's one of your um, platforms as well. Definitely. OK, um, it looks like Marianne has a question um, regarding what are you hearing from your district regarding some of the issues important to them? Mm. So really, I think that it's surprising to me where you can watch the news on any given day and like the kind of headlines and you think, well, that's what everyone's going to worry about or very you know focused on. And it actually really comes down to um, how we our lives and our livelihoods, and also for our family, friends, and neighbors. And I think that people are very upset. I'm hearing a lot. I'm talking to people. You've been with me, right? And <laughs> we're talking to people in their driveway, and they're telling us about how upsetting it is that the um, legislators, and then you also talk about the local and the federal level, but I would not have any impact, right, on that, um, that there's just so much division that they're not actually listening to what it is that um, they are looking for us to get done. And I think that there's so much division that there are people who are worried that we're gonna slide even further backwards in our state and continue to lose people. And then they're worried, especially when I was talking to a man the other day, he's older and he has grandkids. And he's like, I want my kids and my grandkids, I want my grandkids to grow up here in Nebraska and to be successful. And he said, I'm afraid they're gonna move and um, you know, find another place to grow their family. And then they actually might follow. So we're not only losing, losing young people, I think we're uh, missing a large, potential problem that we're going to be losing older Nebraskans as well. Oh, yeah. Did that answer? I'm... Yeah. Okay. Thank you for that question, Marianne. Um, and, uh, oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> sorry. Would you, uh, we got another question here. Would you support bills aimed to recruit and train with special incentives more, um, BIPOC and LGBTQ plus teachers. Okay, so I think that um, we need to recruit and train um, teachers, period. <laughs> we need more teachers. We have a teacher shortage across the state. And it was so important that students see um, themselves reflected in their teachers and within their school. And so we definitely need to have more Black, Indigenous, and people of color as teachers. And at the leadership level, I'm talking, you know, principals, um, coaches, superintendents, things like that. And also, um, we need people who have um, LGBTQ focus, different um, religions, um, people from all sorts of backgrounds, and including uh, disability and income. So yeah, I think that is good that te uh, students see teachers that reflect their experience and then they can, you know, truly kind of see themselves maybe becoming a teacher themselves someday and are succeeding, you know, and, and going on in their education. Yeah. And that's why, you know, it, it's important. And I know that you've mentioned it's important to you too, that um, we get, we have diverse representation. Yes. So um, actually, that leads to um, a question that we have. Yes. 
oh, a comment, sorry, a <laughs> representation from our um, senators. Um, and Kristen's question, many senators in the legislature are retired or represent an upper class, middle class, wealthy demographic. How do we get more everyday people elected to the legislature? Yes. Great question. So we could go on all night, right? There's so many things, um, but there's a few um, actual concrete things that we could do that would improve the diversity of our representation. And I'm talking specifically the legislature. In fact, I want to talk about women. We have seen, um, especially this session, a um, senator has re, uh, resigned and there were a lot of women sharing their experiences that they have had at the unicameral. Um, and they were also sharing experiences of staff. And those people are there on our behalf. And so as Nebraskans, we should expect that those types of situations be handled and that they be um, actually set an example for the rest of the state. And so it was really interesting to me this weekend when I was reading an article, Senator Carol Blood has focused on uh, legislators, women legislators. There's like a day where you celebrated, I think it was on Sunday. Mm -hmm. And there was an article where they highlighted all of the women uh, in the legislature. And we only have like 14 out of 49. And I think we're like 50% of the population, right? So it's, much. or more, <laughs> right? Yeah. So I we obviously need more women in the legislature and moms and I believe younger people. And we need more people who are black and indigenous and um, people of color. Uh, definitely as far as various religion backgrounds or people of no religion. Um, there are barriers though for people to run and one of them is uh, pay. <laughs> and it's hard for someone to imagine running for legislature, the uh, senators only make a thousand dollars a month. And I think Nebraskans, when they hear that, understand that we should be paying a more equitable wage to our senators so that we could allow, so it would be something that other people could even consider. And that it not just necessarily be retired people or people that, you know, are in a situation where, you know, they're um, able to get off work for uh, 90 days one year and 60 the next. And in fact, every senator says it's full time anyway throughout the year. Um, so it's something I think that needs to be worked on. And Senator Vargas had a bill a few years ago that would have tied Senator Wage to the median income from the state. And then it would have been moving with the success that Nebraskans were achieving. And I think that that is a good, I just think that's a really fair and um, specific way to solve that problem instead of just trying to put a say, oh, you know, I think it's worth X or Y. Um, another barrier is regarding childcare. And Senator Hunt had a bill um, that I believe she worked with the Nebraska Accountability and Disclosure Commission because there was kind of a loophole um, crack that people were falling through where they were not able to use their campaign funds for childcare expenses. And when I read the bill, um, my head about exploded <laughs> because one of the requirements to be able to use those funds is that you had to be able to say that you were at an event with your spouse and that your spouse was then unable to provide the child care at home. So, I mean, this was written how many years ago, right? And yeah, it's very outdated. outdated. You know, like I'm going to bring my wife and so she can't watch the kids at home. Well, we have people who are single. We have people who have, you know, dual income families where everyone has a job. And it's just not reasonable that we would make that a requirement regarding those um, campaign funds. So I am it's, it's kind of obvious then who made laws like that and <laughs> why we need diverse representation. Right. I just, I hope they pass that one. I really do. And um, okay, so those are a few of the things. And I think it also is important that people um, understand that everyday Nebraskans know best what everyday Nebraskans need. And so I think that we need to encourage people 
to run. I know that I took a long time to even consider it. You know me, I tried to recruit people. And um, now that I've kind of put my, stuck my neck out, <laughs> I'm trying to encourage other people, especially young people. We have so many smart people that I think would just be amazing. And if we can help them see now that this um, service, this civic service would be something that would benefit not just them and you know their immediate uh, demographic, but also the whole state. Because when we are growing our state and attracting and keeping young people and growing their families, that's good for everybody. It's good for business. Right. <laughs> so, if for no other reason than that. Yeah. Um, I love your passion, Cindy. Um, I know I'm worried. Something. I know that you want to keep everyone informed, and we had an important um, re redistricting last year. So, yes, one of our questions is what are the boundaries of your district? Yes, they have changed. And we are finding that people who are very um, involved have even been surprised to find out that they weren't aware about how some of their boundary lines had changed, not just at the legislature level, but at others too. And so when we're talking about um, the legislature, you can go to the Nebraska legislature website and do the find your senator um, uh, form. And I think we'll put the link. I'm sure yep, we'll put the link below on that. It's rolling along the bottom right now. So important to do. And our boundary lines did change for district four. Um, we, moved a little bit further west between Dodge and Blondo. And we also picked up a little bit more um, from Pacific to center. So it's like 144th. Well, like Bob Boozer kind of area to 180th. And that kind of is new. Uh, we lost, I'm finding that a lot of people that were used to be in my district um, are now with other senators. Um, we don't go past Maple at all at this point. We used to have an area that bumped out past Maple um, going north. And then from 144th to 132nd, we don't have from Blondo to Maple now. So is it 144th up to like 180th or where does it cut off on the west? on the 192nd, if you go from Dodge to Blondo. And I have, I'm actually gonna be sharing a, a cleaner picture of our map. Okay. Redistricting was very frustrating to a lot of us that the maps that were produced were, um, I know that they did their best, the people that were working on them kind of into the wee hours of the night and it was last minute, but there are better maps available and I will make sure and post that. And then I know Douglas County election commission, if I can just make a plug, they are also trying to educate people about how their boundary lines have changed for various elected officials that you might be electing or, you know, to represent you and your polling places too. So they are sending out a postcard. This one's going to be yellow and it will indicate to you what precinct in your ward, where your polling place is. And it's also a good idea to just go online. They have an actual area on their website that you can check. So it's important to do that and make sure that you're researching, um, you know, who, which candidates you're choosing among. And I would like to make another plug for the League of Women Voters because they have a voter guide that is great and helps list, you know, um, your candidates and some of their positions. And if you vote by mail, you can sit at your kitchen table and look it all over while you're deciding. So, and that was League of Women Voters? Mm -hmm. That's called okay. Vote 411. Vote411.org. They're going to be putting that out pretty soon, I think. Yep. And um, yeah, so if you check your card um, and your polling place changed, because a lot of people might be voting in person this year instead of by mail because of oh. COVID restrictions being lifted. But voting by mail is always safe and secure. And we yes. know that we like to get it done early and checked off the list. So probably get it done as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. I, think I, I prefer voting by mail, but I've talked to a lot of people and there are a lot in my district who prefer to vote in person. And I get it because Fred likes to as mm -hmm. well. We used to take all of our kids and go and vote together. It's an experience. An example. Yeah. yeah. And you get a sticker. Yeah. <laughs> you get a sticker. You do get a sticker if you vote by mail too. They send it in the mail with you. Yes. And <laughs> in fact, they've had, they've said at the 
election commission that you can ask for one and they'll give it to you. I mean, they're more than happy to give it to you. Um, but it, it's important that you vote. And I think a lot of people are a little discouraged with seeing how things have become so partisan and they think, well, my vote doesn't matter. It really does, especially at these local level races. So I really hope that everyone will take advantage and um, have their voice heard. And especially voting in primaries, because mm -hmm. primaries really choose who are going to be our next leaders. Those primary voters is a small, small pool of voters. So those people are ultimately deciding a lot of things for you if you don't get out there and vote in the primary. So mm -hmm. we'll just remind people that the primary in-person in person voting is May 10th this year. Yes. Polls are open 8 to 8, but early voting starts. They will start mailing ballots April 4th. So that's mm -hmm. coming up super soon. If you are voting early, just make sure and fill it out, sign it, and get it back right away. Yes. And then no one will call and bug you or knock on your door. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to say I still have mine. <laughs> I need to get these returned and um, sent in for my mail ballots, but you do have the deadline isn't April 4th for that. So I, just no, it's, to I think. believe it's all the way until May 2nd. You can yeah. still get vote by mail requests. Yep. So, and if anyone needs any help, they can reach out to the study group page or your campaign page, and we will definitely help them if they need yes. any answers about how to vote questions answered. Right. I mean, I'm not going to tell people, well, yes, vote for me. <laughs> but as far as like uh, to help you find how to vote, I'm not going to obviously insist that you vote a certain way. I'm happy to help everybody. Right. I know. I know. You're civic minded heart. I know. <laughs> OK, so um, I think we really touched on everything Um we that um, I wanted to talk about. Is there anything else that you want to talk about that really, you know, that we should definitely touch on? Um, well, okay. So one of my passion projects is through the legislative study group to share the recordings of the legislature so that everyday Nebraskans can watch and follow along what is happening on the floor as well as in the committee hearings. And, you know, we were so lucky that Joseph showed us how to record those um, starting, you know, it's been now over a year. It's, we're going on our second year now um, with recording and we have been able to capture more of the committee hearings now, you know, cause they all happen at the same time. Mm -hmm. And so we do share that on our Facebook page and YouTube. And I was so excited that Senator Brewer had brought a bill this year to um, have the Nebraska public media record everything and archive and digitize the um, recordings. And so they would be searchable. And that way, as a Nebraskan, I could go and find my senator and all of their uh, bills, you know, and watch as far as like what the um, pros and cons, you know, opponents, proponents and all that kind of stuff. But then also the debate on the floor. A lot of people don't realize it is live streamed on N Nebraska public media and then it's gone. And so many people don't have cable anymore, right? The DVR, a lot of people are doing um, maybe recording with their fire stick or something like that. But just most people are watching it on their computer now. Yeah. And it's um, it disappears. And so it's not easy also to go back and try to find any um, thing that in particular you might be looking for. And so I was really pleased when Senator Brewer brought that bill and the people that came to testify, it was bipartisan. There were people from all parties and, and um, other civic organizations that came to testify in support of that. And I know that there's a price tag involved, but I think as far as good government, it is um, worth it. So I'm hoping that the senators will consider moving that along. I know they're running very low on time for this short session. And it makes me so sad because <laughs> I think they could have taken advantage. You know, there's so many things they could be taking advantage of this year, transformative changes that they could make. Um, but if it doesn't pass, I will be definitely bringing that bill um, when I'm a senator. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that um, Senator Brewer, I know I touched on this a bit earlier, but Senator Brewer was gushing over you, even though we don't agree with a lot of the things um, that he, you know, he does, that was one thing that we appreciated. So, um, 
Um, <clears throat> I know that he was uh, very happy that you were there to. Well, we talked and he's, um, and this is the thing. I will work with everybody to try to get good legislation passed. And I feel like um, there are people have good, I think most legislators have good intentions and hopefully we can help some of the senators see if they're not realizing some of the results from the legislation that they would bring. Like for Senator Brewer, I just um, have enjoyed having the chance to kind of talk with him a little bit. And, um, but as uh, you know, we've been watching other bills go through. I mean, I'm, I'll just talk about it because it's such a it's a difficult topic, and I think people need to talk about difficult topics more. Um, but as far as like gun regulation, I think people have a right to bear arms, and we have, um, we do in our household. And um, Fred has actually taken, you know, the specific permit process and the training and everything to be qualified for that concealed carry. We think it's just really kind of just the bare minimum, and that it isn't too much to ask that we would have a permit process and training for people to carry a deadly weapon. Mm -hmm. And so I appreciate Senator Brewer and his service and um, definitely think that if it's a barrier to some people who want to do that, we could find a way to help the state make that available. I don't care if we charge for it, right? Just let's make sure people are trained, <laughs> you know? So um, I, I'm hoping that they can continue to work on that bill before they pass it mm -hmm. so that it isn't just um, like the, uh, you know, with no training uh, mm -hmm. required. Cause I just think it is important. Um, you know, we saw, unfortunately a young man who was killed just two weeks, was it two weeks ago? Right. Um, there were people who obviously maybe didn't have the training to understand how you should treat a gun, whether it's, you know, whether you know it's loaded or not, there are certain things that you need to be careful of. And it's just tragic. I mean, just tragic um, that this friend um, had that happen. So I just think that there's more that we can all agree on. I just don't want us to have the law change to the point where we have people carrying guns that have no training, no permit. We don't know who, we don't know where, and then it's going to be really difficult if we have a lot more um, violence. And my kids, Luke, he's, he was the same age as the Sandy Hook kids. And so I remember when he was in uh, just starting elementary school on how it changed the press, the procedures changed dramatically for kids and um, the weight of that is on the shoulders of all students. They have to be prepared now for active shooter drills. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I'm saying? Like these types yeah. of things um, as parents, it's our, uh, Nebraskans, adults, it's our responsibility to try to solve that. And the major um, form of, unfortunately, uh, the, the major form of gun violence is actually suicide. And, and so we need to be doing a lot more to help people with their mental health and um, resources so that people, um, you know, don't take those drastic measures. It's just, it's really tragic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, and it just oh. <laughs> reiterates the point again that you are there to look for solutions and you're not necessarily polarized to one side mm -hmm. or another. Right. I just want to make Nebraskans better. And I think that's your overall message that, um, you know, we've been telling voters at the doors and yeah. um, it's been received very well because I think people are just honestly sick of nothing ever getting solved. Like their lives are just, you know, on hold while politicians fight with each other. So um, along those lines of talking to voters, I'm sorry. Oh, did you have one more thing? Go ahead. <laughs> I'm going to stop. I'm going to. <laughs> Please call your senators and ask them to vote for um, 1073. Okay. And um, is it 121, Senator Hunts? 
1073 is to bring emergency rental assistance from federal dollars to our state, and it actually would go to landlords. So it would benefit them as they're, you know, with their profits, they would be spending their dollars in Nebraska businesses. So federal taxpayers, we pay that money no matter what. And if that money doesn't come to Nebraska, those $120 million, they're going to send it to other states. So it's, I cannot believe this, but the senators are going to have to force the governor to do that with LB 1073. Mm -hmm. Please call your senator and ask him to pass that. And then uh, Senator Hunt's bill that was just discussed today on the floor. LB 121. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a lot of people that don't realize that if you're eligible for SNAP benefits, um, and it does require, like, you you have to work. And <laughs> there's certain requirements to even be eligible for SNAP. And the amount per day is not very much. It's like $3 a day or something like that. Um, we, people are ineligible for SNAP benefits if they've had a drug felony conviction on their record. Apparently, if you have a violent conviction or something like that, you can still receive SNAP benefits in Nebraska, but there's an additional law on the books that restricts and denies nutrition to people who've had drug convictions. And that could be many years ago. It could be someone who's sober now it, or not. I mean, really, we don't want any of our neighbors to be hungry. Right. So um, those dollars are federal as well. So I wish that people would call their senator and ask them to support that bill. Yeah, it's so I'll important. Stop. I'm sorry. I'll stop. <laughs> no, I know you could go on all night. And that's why we love you. You're passionate. And you're, you just, you listen to everyone, no matter who they are, no matter what side they're on, you listen and you really try to come up with solutions to, for Nebraskans. And um, I just really appreciate you and all the work you do. And that's why I um, and am happy to volunteer for your campaign. And I will make a plug for this weekend's big canvas to join Team Cindy. Yes. For our I think first the weather day. looks good. What? I think it's supposed to be nice outside. Yes, I think it, last I looked, it was like 60 degrees and sunny. So should be done with this cold, blistery stuff, <laughs> hopefully by then. But yeah, that's what the forecast says. So please sign up. The event is... Um, it's March 26th. It says 21st, but it's actually March 26th. March 26th, this yes. Saturday. Yeah, so the stream. 1 p.m., we're meeting at Karma Coffee, which is 156th and Dodge, yeah. um, in the district, in Cindy's District 4, supporting local business, too. Yes. Um, we'll have a quick training um, for the app that we use for our voter data. And if you don't want to use the app, we'll have some printed sheets. Sure. We'll have um, the walk pack, everything you need. Um, just come and I promise you won't regret it because supporting an amazing candidate like Cindy and there's truly no one better suited for this job <laughs> than you and you have the experience, you have the passion. I'm just so excited to get you elected and I just we need to just get out there and let the voters know who you are because that's all it takes. As soon as they meet you, they want to vote for you. We know that. But <laughs> so I really just want to encourage people to come join us. If you don't, if you're really uncomfortable with knocking, you can just stick the lid in the door or um, <clears throat> come and we can give you a list to make phone calls or write postcards. So um, but I really appreciate, really appreciate the help. And, right. um, yeah. And I'm, we put on here that you can find my information at Cindy for Yep. Several so, times. Yeah. yeah definitely. Thank you. I know I took too long. I'm sorry. No, you did great. We're right on time. Um, is there any final closing words to leave us with? I'd really love to hear from people in my district. If there are things that are concerning you, um, anything that you were wanting to learn more about or wanted to understand about me um, that you could tell me about what your priorities are, please call uh, or send an email and I would love to talk. All right. Mm -hmm. Sounds great. And I hope to see a lot of people this weekend and that's all we've got for tonight. So have a great evening, Thank everyone. You. Thank you, Cindy. Bye. Bye.